Well-known author, investment banker, consumer advocate, analyst, trader. Chris Markowski is the watchdog on Wall Street. You want answers? Exposing the lies and myths that the big brokerage firms, the mainstream press, and the government are pushing to keep Americans away from financial freedom. You can't handle the truth. Bringing America the truth about what really happens in the financial world. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not here to indulge in fantasy, but in political and economic reality. This is the Watchdog on Wall Street. Oh, man, that's been an interesting week. What you think? Woo-wee! Well, everybody, welcome to the Watchdog on Wall Street show. Um, I'm spinning a little bit. I have to admit, I've been extraordinarily busy. A lot of, uh, a lot of guest appearances on uh, programs, Wednesday in particular, trade day. Trade deal day. Um, I actually had to pick myself up and take myself to New York. Got on the train and um, actually did my first uh, television hit from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on Wednesday. All the television shows that I've done over the years, and they're all archived up there at our website. It's the first time I- I've ever done one on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And, and you know, I-, 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 I got there, and I have to admit, I was feeling a bit nostalgic. I, I went on the air with a uh, gentleman one of the uh, head honchos over at China Beige Book. They're an American group that actually puts out true data in regards to China, not all the nonsense that the Chinese put out. But anyway, I'm sitting there talking to him, and he's, he's a bit younger than I am, and I was explaining to him, I said, I, I do miss the old days. The New York Stock Exchange right now is pretty much a backdrop. It's pretty much a soundstage. It's a big, beautiful building where they broadcast a lot of live TV, and they do a lot of uh, sponsorships for firms, and there's advertisements everywhere in the background. It wasn't always that way, and I have to admit, I like things better the old way. What's that old saying? Sometimes the old ways are best. Anyway, let's get into the the trade deal. I um, I told you. I told you tariffs work i told you we made fun of the wall street journal we made fun of the powers that be all of the uh conservative think tanks out there and the club for growth and all these things tariffs are bad and tariffs are bad and tariffs won't work oh really they don't huh even larry kudlow who has always been an anti-tariff guy Even Larry Kudlow, when he is being interviewed about the trade deal, and he's ecstatic about what's been accomplished, he actually kind of gave in a little bit and said, you know, they worked. Again, I I don't know what what people out there think might have happened with the Chinese. They they, they think that we're going to be able to pull off some sort of Jedi mind trick and get them to comply? Are you kidding me? (laughs) We have had god-awful trade policy here in the United States for decades. For decades. And I'm not talking just China. NAFTA. NAFTA was a disaster. Ross Perot was right. People would make fun of Ross Perot. I got giant second sound from Mexico. He was right. Take a look at what happened to manufacturing here in the United States. And what were we told by the powers that be? Oh, it's just a natural thing. And Obama jobs, those jobs are not going to come back anyway. Nonsense. Complete, utter nonsense. The tariffs work. Now, the Chinese have had, they've showed for the past couple of years, 6% growth. That's unacceptable to them. And let me tell you about that 6% growth. It's a fugazi. I I want you to think of the scene again, Donnie Brasco. Donnie Brasco and 
Lucky comes up to, to Donnie. He hasn't even met him yet. It's Donnie the jeweler. And he, he shows him that uh, diamond ring. It's a beautiful thing. Look at that. That's a beautiful thing. And uh, Donnie's like, it's a fugazi. It's not real. Anything that comes out of China, any information in regards to growth, their economy, is a fugazi. I was talking to the gentleman. We had the same, basically seeing eye to eye, the guy from China Beige Book. And I said, they had negative growth there. They're not growing at all. In fact, they're going backwards in China right now. I said, you're right. And we were also talking about all of the aid that the Chinese government gives to their companies, keeping companies afloat that should go out of business. Like, That's not going to end well. He's like, you're right. It's not going to end well. You know, it's this um, this ongoing thing that we have here as Americans. Not, not all of us, but the mainstream media and politicians out there that, oh, no, it's the Chinese. They're scary. Their economy is going to be so big. It's a dragon. Rah! And we're supposed to be afraid. It was the same thing we were hearing about. Iran and taking out Soleimani. Oh, no. That's Iran. They got a real scary military. Got to be scared. We're the United States of America. And we've been running and hiding from our problems for a very long period of time. Now, that they listen. I've got my theories why. I got my theories why. I'm a a long-term thinker. I, I look at things, but I, I use my company as an example. I'll use Markowski Investments as an example. There's no short-term thinking here at our company and what we're trying to build and what we're trying to do. There's no short-term thinking when it comes to our clients and what we're trying to do. Unfortunately, in our country, and a lot of this has to do with how executives are paid in this country, Everything is about next quarter. Got to beat next quarter's numbers by any means necessary. Not thinking about not thinking about where we're going to be five years from now. Not thinking about where we're going to be ten years from now. It's next quarter because that's how I get paid. Too much short-sighted thinking by our politicians and also by many corporations here in the country, which sold us down the river. In many respects. Now, again, I, I'm, I'm not a Donald Trump cheerleader. I'm, I'm cheering on what he's done right here, without a doubt. What, what do you think Make America Great Again is all about? Oh, I know the lefties out there. He wants to take us back to Jim Crow laws. He wants Ku Klux Klan rally. No. No. He wants to see every American, just as much as I do, do well, to have a good job to be able to live the American dream, to see their kids do better than they do. That's all. That's all it is. And and listen, we, we cannot have, we cannot do business with people. We cannot conduct trade with people who are stealing from us. I I talked about trade for ages here on the program. I said the the ideal trade agreement is about a paragraph long. That's it. About a paragraph long where you just say, okay, no tariffs on you, no tariffs on me. We're not going to subsidize companies. You're not going to subsidize companies. Away we go. Let's have fun. Let's do business. It hasn't been that way. How do, you, how do you compete? How do you compete in a country that says, okay, you want access to our markets? You want to sell to our citizens? Well, you've got to give us your secret sauce. You've got to tell us exactly how that product is made. It'll never work. Can you actually ab- believe that we've agreed to this? We've been doing this since the Clinton administration. And nobody has done a damn thing about it. Nobody. We just keep going on. Oh, because Wall Street says so. Corporations, I can keep it going. Uh, cheap labor over there. 
I, I remember uh, <laughs> remember several years ago, there was some stupid toy that the kids were messing around with, these silly bands, which were just these colorful bands that they would put around their arms and legs. Sometimes they'd weave them together. And I, I saw that, and I was like, yeah, some guy, you guys are paying for somebody's Ferrari in China right now. We got addicted to cheap junk. Cheap junk that was not made well. And you know what? Again, we, we're, we play a part in that. We're, we're partially to blame for this. I remember 10, 15 years ago discussing trade here on the pro. I said, what the hell happened to Made in America, huh? What the hell happened to Made in America? You know as well as I do. It says Made in America on it. You know it's going to be a superior product. And we're not the only country in the world. Made in Italy, made in Germany, made in the U.K., made in France. We're not the only country that makes high-quality items. Why are we marketing that again? Well, we got to continue to sell cheap junk, don't we? Anyway, you want to take a look at this trade deal. And, again, everybody is focusing on the items that China says that they're going to purchase. I, I describe this as a cherry on top of a sundae. It's all well and good. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? This is stuff that China has to buy anyway. Yeah, they're gonna, they have to eat, right? They need the, they need the soybeans. They need the items that they say that they're going to buy. Now, there's question right now whether or not they're going to be able to purchase as much as they said they're going to purchase. We'll see. We'll see. I think if they get most of the way there, we're heading in the right direction, not to mention some of the items they're agreeing to buy they've never bought from us in the past. The key right now is the structure of the deal, where if you don't follow and you don't go by the rules, guess what? You have a little sit-down over a 90-day period of time. And if uh, someone is in the wrong, guess what? Tariffs go back on. Another thing, the tariffs aren't off. We still have tariffs on $360 billion worth of Chinese goods. Yes, we lowered tariffs from 15% down to 7.5%, and we didn't initiate tariffs, I think, on about $160 billion worth of goods. But without a doubt, this is a, a step in the right direction. We've got to get to that point in time where we have intellectual property rights. Again, again, we build things and we create things in this country. Create. When you pick up, when you go to Apple and you buy an iPhone, it doesn't say made in America. It says designed in Cupertino, California. We design things. We have to be able to hold on to that. And, again, if we get to that point in time, and, again, we're, we don't know. Like I said, we, there's more to come this year. We're in the right place. But, again, again, I, I did find it fascinating. Did find it fascinating. Everybody out there, the whole, hell, the entire mainstream media, all of the financial journals out there told you what? Told you that tariffs were not going to work. Told you that this trade war was going to destroy the American economy. Our economy has grown. China's has gone backwards. We are at unemployment levels that we haven't seen in 50 years. I call that a win. You are what your record says you are. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Our newsletter, consultations with our certified financial planners, all sorts of fantastic stuff there at our website. Please, I invite you, take advantage, people. It's a great resource. Get to Watchdog on WallStreet.com. We have a 24-hour day help hotline, 800-471-5984. That number again is 800-471-5984. 84. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back. Taking Wall Street's liars, crooks, and cheats out behind the woodshed. You're listening to the Watchdog on Wall Street. To all of our uh, new listeners out there, one of the things that we repeat again and again and again and again and again 
conventional wisdom is poison. And, and we have a, a problem here in this country. I don't think it's just unique to this country. We, 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 people like to reside in groupthink. Every once at one, once one person does something and it might be successful, everyone else has to do it. I'm going to give you um, an example of this. The uh, conventional wisdom right now, and I'm going to talk about football, the NFL. The NFL is a passing league. It's a passing league, and you've got to do it this way or you're going to lose. <clears throat> Tennessee Titans. Why? You don't see them passing the ball all over the place. No, people. The idea is you want to think different. When everybody is saying the same thing on television, on the news, you know what? Something is wrong. And this is why you tune in here to this program. Because we see through all of their bull excrement. Going back to the 1990s, late 1990s, when I was just doing guest appearances, and we're warning everybody about the dot-coms, and we warned you about Enron, and we warned you about WorldCom and Dynagy and all that other garbage that was taking place, to the real estate bubble, telling you, guess what? The real estate market is overvalued. This is not, this is not sustainable. This is a bubble. This is going to cause problems. We told you. Time and time again, we defy, and we're right. Anyway, I got to talk about this. This um, there was a, a an op ed. There was an op ed in the Financial Times, written by a guy by the name of Charles Plowden. Now, I had no idea who this guy is. He is a partner. Okay, he's a partner at a Scottish investment firm called Bailey Gifford, and he in his piece in the Financial Times, he went off on short selling. Now, if you're not familiar with short selling is, short selling is you sell a stock that you don't own because you think it's going to go down. Kind of like the same thing if you buy a put option. You think that this, the stock is overvalued and you think it's going to go down. Now, how you go about doing this is you actually have to, you have to sell something. You have to borrow shares. And brokerage firms lend out shares, part of the business that they do. So you borrow them, then you sell them. Now, what you're, what you're expecting to have happen is the stock to drop, then you buy back that stock, and you return it, and you make the difference. Now, this guy in this article is saying that this is bad. This is not good. We, we, the, our, our markets, our financial system has a vested interest in promoting short-term trading, and that's wrong. That's speculating. That's not an investment. What? And he talks about price discovery. And he says, is such price discovery really helpful or necessary? What this guy is saying is, is that basically companies shouldn't go out of business. We shouldn't try to find the losers out there and warn people. That's not right. That's not fair. This is the stock market, sorry, for millennials, where everybody gets a participation trophy. No. It's not how it works. Companies need to go under if they're no good. We miss out. I just can't. And this is a Scottish firm. Adam Smith was Scottish for crying out loud. If we keep, if companies stay around and we don't have true price discovery, if we don't figure out that the company is garbage, then money will continue to flow to that company and it's a misallocation of resources, which is not good for our economy. This guy ever read any Joseph Schumpeter, Creative Destruction? The idea that we shouldn't be isolating companies that are wrong, that are losers, to me is insane. Again, it, it's, it, 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 I feel like it. it's like, a, oh, here you go. 
Oh, who cares if you lose money? You can get a trophy, too. At least you tried hard. Man, um, if this is, this is money managers going forward, I, I feel sorry for a lot of people that don't have a good one. I really do. Hey, hey you happen to have any money with this, this Bailey Gifford? Okay? Run. Run. These people are morons. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Again, our newsletter, consultations with our certified financial planners, all sorts of fantastic stuff. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. We shall return. This is the Watchdog on Wall Street. Welcome back, everybody. I love uh, I love finding various different little financial planning retirement stories out there, written by uh, written by I get written by kids usually, and they really don't know much. They were they come up with something and they're given an assignment, and they they go and they come up with an article and. They really don't have any perspective. And there was one that I saw this past week where it talks about uh, um, experts revealing steps to no regrets retirement. No regrets. Huh? Anyway, it, it, it bother you? I'm just, I know I'm going off the beat track a little bit when people say, oh, yeah, I lived life and I had no regrets. Well, then you, my friend, are an anal sphincter. Oh, you, you went through your entire life and you don't regret saying something doing something, making a mistake. Really? Really? Again, that, that's somebody that I, I want to avoid. Anyway, anyway, there was a study out there. Um, is it uh, Transamerica. 73% wish they would have saved more money on a consistent basis. 50% wish that they had started sooner saving money. Okay. Me too. Me too. Seventy-three percent. I'm surprised not a hundred percent. I wish I wish I had started saving more money when I was even younger. Okay, I, I do. Again, but an amount that makes sense. We talked about this the past couple of weeks here on the program about paying yourself every single month, but making that amount of money something that is reasonable, something that you can live with. Okay, does that that makes sense? You don't want to. You don't want to wreck your life based upon having to save money. In this thick column as well, they're talking about regrets that retirees have. And, yeah, some of them were just obscene. I, I, listen, we have a unique perspective here, and it's kind of what makes our firm unique and our program here unique. Um, we have clients not only all over the country, but we have them all over the world. So when, when I talk about something and what we hear back from our clients, um, this is stuff, information that we've compiled from people everywhere. We're a big country, different cultures all around our country. But what we're hearing and what we've been hearing and hearing it for a while is that many people wished they kept working. They wished they hadn't retired so soon. Many of them as well. This is a big one. They had wished, it's regret, wished when they were younger, had traveled more, gotten out and about more, or started a business. I hear that one, too. I wish I got involved with that business. I wish I had started that business. Now, again, this is something that we encourage here. Again, if the business makes sense. Many times our clients will approach us, hey, I got this business this guy wants to start. Oh, you know, when I was thinking about opening a restaurant, have you ever washed a dish? Have you ever cooked? Have you ever bartended? Have you ever waited tables? No, no, don't do it. <laughs> so, yeah, people people wish they, they do things. And oftentimes, based upon the fact that they set a retirement date, or, or they, they, they basically put themselves, they box themselves up. Box themselves up, and they don't they don't go through that door of opportunity. Another one that we get a lot is in regards to certain expenditures that people made, whether it be a, a really expensive car they wish they hadn't had bought, or a boat that they wish they hadn't had bought, or a house 
that was just way too expensive, that they put way too much money into. That's big. It is. And another thing we're hearing a lot from people is is when they they get to that point in time where maybe they're working a little bit, maybe they're retired. What are we going to do with our time? What are we going to do with our time? Are we going to spend are we going to spend more of our time with our grandkids? Are we going to spend our time doing community service? Are we going to spend our time doing travel? Again, this is stuff that you have to work out with your spouse. And again, it's all a part of your plan, all a part of what you want to do. And again, you have to do that. You have to do that together as a couple, as a family. Got to take a break. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Newsletter. Consultations again with our certified financial planners. Get your financial plan done the right way. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Our 24-hour day help hotline, 800-471-5984. That again, number uh, 800-471-5984. The only man who is taking on the Wall Street establishment. You're listening to The Watchdog on Wall Street with Chris Markowski. I think I mentioned that in the program. My, uh, my little one, my youngest one, who was in eighth grade. Um, he wanted a turntable for Christmas. He got one. And uh, I'm pleasantly surprised that, you know, Dad, uh, can you get me a uh, David Bowie album? Sure. <laughs> anything, anything but that usual music that you kids listen to, no problem. I'll run right out and get it. Anyway, <laughs> um, we talked uh, talking about retirement, talking about financial plan. We also talked here on the program about what's happening in various different places around the globe, in particular the, um, the, the riots that are taking place in France just because they want to make some changes to their, their government pension plan that, quite frankly, makes sense. They can't afford it anymore. Um, we talked about sinkholes that are out there stuff you have to stuff you have to look out for that many people counted on they just automatically assume again conventional wisdom they're always going to be there it's going to be okay yeah um universal life popular insurance program sold back in the 1980s it's turning into a black hole yeah. Now, Universal Life is an insurance product that includes both insurance and a savings account that earns income. The income was designed to pay the future costs of maintaining the premiums rather than have the inevitable increase due to mortality concerns. Again, the premiums are going to go up as you get older. That just makes sense. These products were sold with Snoopy. Remember MetLife used to think the peanuts can't miss. Oh, what a great winner this was. Look, I told the story here on the program. This is back when I was in college and I was interning. I was interning at the Equitable. And, and, and the insurance salesman there that I was interning for tried to get me to buy an insurance policy like this when I was still in college. Not kidding. We've also got issues out there as far as sinkholes, pitfalls, whatever it may be. We've talked about the pension evaporation. There are nearly one million working and retired Americans that are currently covered by pension plans that are in impending danger of insolvency. And guess what? That number is going to continue to grow. The Pensions Rights Center has found that over the next couple of years, the number of workers that will be exposed will be upwards of 10 million. Many pension plans are now applying to be eligible to commence making cuts. In the cuts made, the payouts for retirees have dropped in some cases. Again, you don't see this in the news. Nothing to see here. Keep moving on. As much as 60%. As much as 60%. And those are private pensions. Public pensions is another thing. Now, again, many of these, many of these states, many of these 
municipalities out there. Uh, they count on, hey, that's okay. We can get ourselves a bailout. God forbid we try to be responsible and do the right thing. Now, now they're not. Um, what, what we've been trying to get across to people out there is that personal responsibility. We talk about personal responsibility here uh, often. And my, I don't blame anybody for anything. Anything. If something goes wrong, my life, my business, whatever it may be, I own it. Because if, if I own it and I accept blame for everything, then I know that I can go out and I can fix the problem. Personal responsibility is also getting to the point in time where you can be self-reliant. I know. People say, well, I worked hard and I put money into that pension. I was a member of a union. Okay, that's all well and good. And, and you can blame the people that ran the union. You can blame that you were lied to. But you know what? Isn't it better if you put money aside for yourself as well? Do you think that's wise? We do. Break time. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back. Chris Markowski is the Watchdog on Wall Street. You should believe in math, not magic. You're listening to The Watchdog on Wall Street with Chris Markowski. Yeah, it's, it, questions are coming up a lot lately. Ever since we've seen the, the stock market racing through the roof, continue to, to make all, all-time highs. And, you know, there's a the beep people that interview me you know what do you think about the markets of 2020 mr markowski what do you think is going to happen with the markets are we a bit a little bit heavy on top right now are you worried uh i'm always worried always worried when markets race through the roof I know this is something that I often repeat here on the program, but when stock markets race through the roof, I get nervous. I actually was doing a program, this television show, this past week, and, and the host asked me about that. And I said, and I, I gave my, my bonsai tree analogy there with Mr. Miyagi teaching Daniel son about the bonsai tree, cut here, snip here. If you're the guy who's managing your money is not looking to rotate assets in your portfolio. Something's wrong. There are also a lot of high quality assets that are out there that have underperformed. Many of them pay pretty nice dividends. Now let's think about this as a strategy. Let's take a look. Let's say one of our clients has a portfolio that's got certain amount of Apple in it and Amazon and other, you know, parts of more aggressive part of their portfolio, even though Apple is, is, a, is a, not so much of a growth company like it used to. But you take a look at the performance of that stock over the course of the year. Did I sell Apple a year ago when it was much lower? Yep. Did I buy it for certain clients that came in a year ago? Yep. And one would scratch and say, well, what the hell? You're selling it? You're buying it? Well, don't you have an opinion on this thing? I didn't sell it all. I didn't sell it all. I, don't sell, I won't dump an entire company unless I think it's ridiculously overvalued or I think that there's something fundamentally wrong with the company. When I buy a company, God willing, I want to hold on to the thing forever. I know that's not the case. And we've talked about even blue chips can die, and you have to pay attention to companies. You have to make sure they're growing. you got to take a look at the fundamentals always. But you've seen what Apple has done over the course of the year. Are, are we taking profits and moving it to other asset classes, other stocks out there that haven't done as well? Of course we are. Of course. There was a story that came out this past week talking about how corporate CFOs, corporate CFOs say the economy is going to slow and the stock market is overvalued. 
good. What do I mean by good? That's what you want. Good CFOs, they're like me. I'm, we're, what we do, what we do, we're basically a personal CFO for our clients. That's what we are. We worry. CFOs, I love CFOs that are conservative. That's what you want to have. You want to have, oh, you know what, things are going, you know what, but you want to looking to see what might happen out there and be prepared for it. Nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean you say, oh, you know what, I think the market stopped out. I think the market stopped out. We're just going to sell. There's that old uh, that saying, they always say, oh, sell in May and go away for the entire year. People, you know what that's, that's talk for? That's talk for traders. That's talk for traders. And you know, I, I got a lot of people that I know worked on Wall Street for years. That are still, still, there's still a few of them left. There's not as many traders as there has been in the past. They've been replaced by computers, which we all know aren't performing too well either because all of these quant funds keep going out of business because they're underperforming. And our performance blows theirs away. Blows theirs away. And I don't have, uh, you know, IBM Watson and all these fancy pants computers that can trade faster than, than, you know, a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to move on any news story in a single bound. I don't have any of that. It's a business is what it is. That's what your portfolio is. It's a business. And you have to think of it as such. Oh, okay, well, you know what? This has become a little bit over. Let's take some profits off the table. Let's move over here. Right, here, here was a story. Where, where, where the hell where was I to grab this one? Oh, CNBC. Again, this is a, thank you, CNBC, master of the obvious story. They don't really put these in the front. They're like they're in the back of their website somewhere. Dividend stocks look attractive with a volatile year that nets measly returns expected ahead. First and foremost, they don't know what the returns are going to be over the course here. I don't. I don't know what they're going to be. I don't. I have an idea. I have an idea. But guess what? I don't make decisions based upon a hunch or an idea. I don't. I move on what's real and what I know. And if I see companies that are high quality, fundamental sound, that are low, that have come down, that are paying a dividend. That's attractive to me. You know, it's buy low, sell high. It, it, it works, people. It does. Chasing fads and the latest and greatest and hottest thing out there. That's all well and good. You know, have I rode the Tesla wave on the way up? No. I haven't. Oh, you missed out on that one. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, but, you know, been there, done that. People were making fun of me when I was not on the Enron wave either. And we all saw what happened there. Fundamentals, guys. Fundamentals, valuations. Um, I don't care what what the conventional wisdom is, what those uh, yahoos are saying on TV. They matter. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Just getting warmed up here on the show. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to The Watchdog on Wall Street. Well-known author, investment banker, consumer advocate, analyst, trader. Chris Markowski is the watchdog on Wall Street. You want answers? Exposing the lies and myths that the big brokerage firms, the mainstream press, and the government are pushing to keep Americans away from financial freedom. You can't handle the truth. Bringing America the truth about what really happens in the financial world. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not here to indulge in fantasy, but in political and economic reality. This is the watchdog on Wall Street. It was a, um, a proud week for me. <laughs> I, 
I don't know, man. It was I, I was I was I was really proud of the kids that I've coached over the years this past week. I, I people knew that the program. I've got a sport. I'm a very passionate about lacrosse and I also am I'm very passionate about the other thing I really, really, really love to do, outside of obviously my work and my show and my appearances, again, I guess it's kind of the same because it's educating people. It's I, I love coaching. I love coaching. I am a um, I'm a practice nut when it comes to efficiency. Um, we do everything. I, I just I want I want my kids to succeed. I want them to succeed. I, I really, really do. And uh, this past week, it was it was a great week. I had a bunch of my my players from years ago when I lived down in Florida commit to colleges, some D two, some D three. And I also my team now. I live up here in Long Island. Team I have here in Long Island, which is a very, very competitive team. Right now, I think I've got only three or four kids left that have yet to commit to college. The rest of the team. Every single one of them has committed to a D1 school. And I'm, I'm ecstatic. And one of the kids, um, great kid, tough as nails, real bright. Um, he just committed to, to Bucknell. And I've got to go out. I was thinking about this right before we started the segment, right before I went on the air here today. So i got to go out and i got to buy him Ken Langone's book, I Love Capitalism. I talked about it here on the show a couple years ago. I'm a... I'm a big Ken Langone fan. Say, so, yeah, I, my, yeah, I'm a fanboy of guys like Ken Langone and what he's done. I, I want to get to, I want to get to the point in time where I can start donating hundreds of millions of dollars and help to make uh, NYU medical school free. And you know, he's got his name all over New York with medical centers and the things, the great things that he has done. And he, again, his book was phenomenal talking about his life and the hard work that he put in and where he came from and where he is today. And it was, it was a true shout-out to the free market and capitalism. Again, Van Gogh's an entrepreneur. He built Home Depot, amongst other things. Now, Jamie Dimon talked about Jamie here on the program. Jamie Dimon is the, let's put it, he is the LeBron James of CEOs right now. He is, he's the big, he's the big CEO out there. Um, you know that old commercial back in the, the 1980s with, uh, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. So it's kind of that way with Jamie Dimon as far as business is concerned, as far as the economy is concerned, most certainly as far as Wall Street is concerned. And he was, he was interviewed by Maria Bartiromo, uh, what was it, last, last Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, and he was defending capitalism. He defended capitalism and he defended billionaires, warning socialism would be ruinous, not just to American companies, but to the broader economy. Which again, I mean, it's coming from Jamie Dimon, um, Bright guy, has some weight to what he has to say. But again, it's master the obvious thing as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, um, we'll talk about Jamie Dimon. We'll talk about Jamie Dimon. I'm going to also pull Boeing into this as well. And also understanding what capitalism is. Year after year after year, I, I've gotten into this here on the program. I, I've fought against, uh, I've gone on programs, fought against people. It's, you know, capitalism is broken. Capitalism is not fair. And you even have conserved, capitalism is not perfect, but it's the only system we got. There's no other system. That's, capitalism is nature. Do you understand? It's nature. It, it's like trying to defy Nature is what you're trying to do. And, and people just don't seem to get it. And they, they use the word capitalism. And if they don't like something that is happening within our economy, within our country, they'll say, oh, it's capitalism. It's cap. Oh, you know why we had the financial crisis? Because of capitalism. No. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. 
Financial crisis, quite frankly, had its roots nothing to do with capitalism at all. It had a lot to do with government tinkering and telling people what to do and rules and regulations that defied capitalism. Now, we have issues right now when it comes to our economy, when it comes to the business world here in the United States. And this goes back, I've talked about this for years here on the program, the watchdog on Wall Street, axis of evil, big business, politicians, the mainstream media working hand-in-hand to further their own needs, where we, we have a system here in this country where it's not capitalism. Capitalism, companies need to be able to fail. Last hour here on the program, I was talking about the, uh, the, the column in the Financial Times by some idiot from some Scottish investment firm saying that short selling is bad and price discovery is not that important. What? Yes, it is. You know what's really important? You know what's, what is integral to a, a free capitalistic society? Failure. Failure. When asked um, about 15 years ago in an interview uh, why you, uh, you know, why you're so passionate about the program, why do you, you know, why do you do what you do? And I, I said, I want my kids to grow up in a country where they can succeed beyond their wildest dreams and also fail. Because make no bones about it, I've I've failed. I have failed. I've I've made errors in judgment. Listen, I failed. Pick myself up. But I failed. We have, um, unfortunately, companies here in this country that are too big to fail, supposedly. That's what we're told, right? And it's true. It's true. I, I remember when Eric Holder, Barack Obama's attorney general, I, was, I think it was in front of some Senate Senate committee, or he's being interviewed, and he's talked, they were asking him questions about criminal uh, investigations or prosecutions that take place on Wall Street, and he was basically, I can't do that. I have to be concerned about the overall economy and what, what, what can happen. What? So what you're signaling is, is that the, these companies, based upon their size, based upon their size and their quote, end quote, importance, are untouchable? What we saw over the past week, and it didn't get enough attention, a very similar scenario happened with Boeing than what happened back in the 1990s with the big brokerage firms. However, in Boeing's case, people died. In the 1990s, people lost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars because Wall Street analysts were telling them to buy stocks that they knew were garbage. They knew they were advising people to buy companies that they knew were garbage. This was all of the major brokerage firms. Nobody went to jail for this. Nobody got in trouble for this at all. Oh, oh, oh there were some fines paid. Big whoop de doo dah But, you know, I, I look at it, that is, well, gee whiz, uh, you're, you're ripping people off. That's basically stealing money, Right? Am I, am I right here? Does that make sense to you? Well, there was emails that were discovered behind the scenes, text messages, excuse me, Boeing, people talking about how, the, um, how they didn't like the fact that they were going to have to train pilots and, oh, this, this plane is not that great. It's not safe. I wouldn't let my family fly on this. And, again, you know, Boeing has got its defenders in the mainstream media. Well, you know, this is, could be just disgruntled employees and this, that, and the next thing. Whatever. Whatever, man. Boeing is too big to fail. The, the, the news, the news that those email, those text messages came out, you know the stock went up that day. Boeing's not going anywhere. Okay? And that's wrong. I'm here to tell you that's wrong. Steve Mnuchin has passed away. Well, you know, because the problems with Boeing and the plane, you know, it, it could be a hit to our overall economy. If Boeing is that important to our overall economy, Boeing needs to be broken up. 
Boeing needs to be broken up. Let the military contractor be the military contractor. Let the commercial airline be the commercial airline. Break the thing up. But that tells me there's not enough competition within that industry. If these big Wall Street banks, if one of them goes down, oh, no, take the whole economy down, then guess what? Break them up. We live in a world of these ginormous companies. And again, I know, I've talked about this here on the program. I, 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 I can fix it. I, I can fix what's wrong with our business world. It's not a difficult fix. Yes, you're going to have to break up some big companies. But you know what we also have to do, too? We have to start paying these executives, not just the CEO, but all of their lieutenants, all of their underlings. That we, we have to pay them cash, period. LeBron James makes money, makes a handsome salary playing basketball for the Los Angeles Lakers. He doesn't get stock in the Lakers. He doesn't become a part of owner of the Lakers. He does it. He gets paid. Now, Jamie Dimon, and you can take, take a look at the job he's done over at J.P. Morgan. Jamie Dimon is that great of a CEO. Pay him. Pay him. Pay him cash. Not stock. The reason why we have all of these billionaire CEOs, all of these uh, millionaires since millionaires, it's because of stock. Suckers get paid cash nowadays. You're a sucker. You're a sucker CEO if you get paid cash. The CEO of Google only makes two million bucks a year. It's Google. It's a behemoth. Only makes two million bucks a year. I talked about this. You know, you could be a backup of the backup infielder for the New York Yankees, and you're making more money than that. No, but he makes a ton in stock. This is the problem. You know, I I have a retirement plan at our business, and we have ERISA laws, everybody else does, and and we contribute to our employees' 401K based upon how much money they contribute based upon. We do that. If, If a company wants to issue stock to its employees, You might want to come up with a percentage, a certain percentage that is based upon how much money they make, and it has to be across the board. It has to be across the board. It has to be for everybody. It has to be for the gender. It has to be for the secretary. And it has to be for the CEO. Because we've gotten to a problem right here. You take a look at the uh, ousted CEO of Boeing, the type of money that he made, that he extracted from Boeing, that he's still going to get. We're told, oh, he's getting no severance package. Malarkey. That's a lie. These people are getting wealthy beyond what anybody can understand, and it's because of the stock that they get in the companies. And then the companies turn around and they buy back that stock when they sell it. I know, I've talked about this here on the program. But the more people that understand the racket, the better off we're going to be. There's the problem. There is the problem. I don't know how. I know Trump could could come out and he could totally do this if he chose to. I I don't know if uh, if he's afraid that he's going to get hit with a Scud missile or something. like. I, I, I don't know. But this is the problem that we need to address. They talk about wealth disparity here in the country. This is why. You deal with this, it's over. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Now, again, wait, 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 wait. Hey, before I finish going to, going to the break here, okay, this is different for an entrepreneur. Jamie Dimon didn't start J.P. Morgan. Mullenberg didn't start Boeing. Bill Gates started Microsoft. Jeff Bezos started Amazon. Okay, that's their stock. That's fine. You're going to become a billionaire because you come up with an amazing invention? Fine. Okay? Not managers. Sorry. You want to to become a billionaire? Invent something awesome. 
Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Bringing America financial freedom one listener at a time. You're listening to The Watchdog on Wall Street with Chris Markowski. Yes, you are. Welcome back, everybody. This is The Watchdog on Wall Street show. I, I talked about valuations a little bit earlier on in the program, and I know I, I touched on this as well on the uh, podcast, but I want to get this through everybody's head, okay? Um. Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham, he, he wrote The Intelligent Investor. And Warren Buffett credits Benjamin Graham with basically everything that he knows. And you read the book and uh, grab yourself a couple cups of coffee. It, it, it's really, really dry. It is. A lot of technical stuff in there, but it's dry. But there's some really good points in there. And, and the... the thing I really took away from Benjamin Graham's book is that and it's, it's simple. It says you have to determine what a company's value is. Every company has an intrinsic value to it. At times, times it trades below its value. It's worth more. It's worth more. Buy low. Sometimes it trades above its intrinsic value. Ooh, guess what? Maybe I should take some profits. Um, I want to let everybody know here, the, the percentage of stocks, listed companies, the percentage of listed companies right now that are in the red, that's the bad one, okay? That's the bad one is close to 40%. Forty percent of stocks that are trading outstanding are losing money. Now, some companies, some startups, will lose money for a period of time. They have a business plan that makes sense, and they have projections that make sense, and they're expected to come out of the red at a certain period of time. Many companies out there are biotechnology companies. These are companies that are going out and they're they're trying to come up with the, the next great miracle drug or uh, medical device, whatever it may be, and they don't know. Those companies could go under. They could be working on their drug, working on the drug, get to phase three trials, and oh, doesn't work. Sorry, company gone. That's speculative stuff. But you need to understand, okay, you need to understand that many of these companies that are in the red, that have been racing through the roof or that are still around, they have something called a burn rate, right? They have a certain amount of cash, a certain amount of cash lying around. And you can calculate when that company is going to go out of business based upon the cash that it has unless the business improves marketably. And you've got to determine, that's what we do, whether or not that business is going to improve, whether it's worthwhile. I, I remember in the 1990s going through prospectus after prospectus after prospectus, saying to myself, oh, this one's going to go out of business at this time. It's almost like an alarm clock, for crying out loud. I knew when they were going to go under. Now, many of the companies that are in the red have been getting money thrown at them left and right because there's a racket that's involved with trying to get people out of the stock and keep the company afloat so all the insiders can get out. Then we'll let the thing go out of business. Let me tell you, my friends, that's no different. No different than what was going on at the boiler room operations back during the 80s and 90s. It's a fugazi. Make sure, make sure you know what you're doing. If not, get help. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. We'll be back. Chris Markowski is the Watchdog on Wall Street. Taking Wall Street's liars, crooks, and cheats out behind the woodshed. You're listening to The Watchdog on Wall Street. Ah, 
Now, well, January 10th was a little over a week ago. And um, it, was a, it was a big day in corporate merger history. Big days in corporate merger history. Yeah, January 10th, 2000, AOL Time Warner merged. AOL Time Warner merged. Now, I've seen several pieces out there and pundits and talking heads out there saying, you see, you see, Time Warner, AOL, that merger didn't work out. This is why you don't have to pay attention to breaking companies up. They'll fail anyway. And I get aggravated when I see nonsense like that. I I remember exactly where I was standing when I was watching that press conference. And I was laughing. We were cracking jokes. It was, you know, remember that show Mystery Science Theater 3000, whatever the hell it was called, where they would have science fiction movies and there would be the two guys you see the, their back of their heads making fun of what was going on on the screen. That was basically what I was doing with AOL Time Warner. AOL Time Warner happened. Why? Well, because Wall Street, Wall Street played up the egos of these people. I think Steve Case, he's smarter than that. He knew. He knew that his company was on the outs. He knew it was on the outs. You got mail. In 2000, America Online was the internet, was the internet for, well, with, I would say with training wheels. Yeah, prior a few years, uh, you had cable, dial up was going away. That's when the, the, the cable company started offering internet. Uh, it was, it was done. And they're using that as an example. Of, well, we don't know what we can't, you know, you can let these companies get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Get that. No. No. First and foremost, I, I know this is, um, this is, this is old, uh, old news for my long term listeners. Let me explain to you. Let me explain to you what the mergers and acquisitions departments do at big brokerage firms. Let me tell you what they do. They look around. And they find a CEO, because again, CEOs are what? They're not, they're oftentimes not managers. They're entrepreneurs. That was the case with AOL Time Warner. That was a super big merger, but Steve Case, yes, he started AOL, but he knew his company was dying. This was his way to cash out and really cash out. I think he owns half the islands of Hawaii right now. But anyway. They go and they, they boost up the ego of these CEOs and they tell them that, wow, look at this. You're going to be able to build something. Now, again, CEOs are managers. They have Most of them haven't built a damn thing in their entire lives. Most of them have found ways to step on people's toes and climb the corporate ladder, backstab the right people, talk behind the right person's back, get this one fired or that one fired to get to the position where they are. They're politicians in more ways than one. They haven't built a damn thing. Well, oh, geez. And you know what? They have that longing there, a feeling of inadequacy. And Wall Street mergers and acquisitions departments know this. They're well aware of this. And they prey upon it. And this is why you see these M&A moves all the time. And how often do they work out? Huh? How often do these mega mergers work out? I've said it again and again and again. You can take a look at many of these gigantor companies and you break them up. They will be worth more broken up. They will be more dynamic broken up than they are together. It is what it is. However, but in the world, the way, the way that CEOs are paid today, if you build this ginormous company, you build this ginormous company, they can go and they can say, well, look at the revenues here at this company. Look at all, look at our numbers here. I need to be paid hundreds of millions of dollars in stock. Yeah, I'd like to see one of these 
wizard of smart CEOs run a small company. Run a small part of their company. A, a part of their company that, you know, may be teetering a little, might need some work. Or they, would they be capable of doing that? Or do they just collect other businesses so their, their revenues continue to rise, and it obviously looks like their earnings continue to grow, and they can get paid more. Do have they built anything? Have they created anything? Or are they just collecting? Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. There you go. Again, mergers and acquisitions 101, right here on the Watchdog on Wall Street show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back. This is the Watchdog on Wall Street. Damn straight. Welcome back, everybody. You know, I'm I, I going to go a little old school. I, I, I haven't done, we haven't done a lot of the, the rip-offs and scams here on the program. Uh, when I say old school, uh, back when we started the show years ago, that was primarily what we did. Um, I would grab various different stories that I would hear about. I'd be alerted to, or clients would call up and, oh, I heard about this, or people would call up to become a client and they had gotten ripped off. And we covered that here on the program, and it was all all in an attempt to, to educate people. And I said, you know what, I'll use these ripoffs and scams as an example, and hopefully, hopefully people will pick up on this stuff so they won't get ripped off and scammed. And it... Yeah worked sometimes okay it did um i i have to say that I'm, I'm like i said i'm being honest i mean that was primarily that was all we did on the show um yeah i i would get irate i'd be yelling and screaming about what was going on and look at this jerk and look at this ripper we warned people about madoff everybody but it it didn't matter it didn't matter people they convinced themselves people believe what they want to believe and if that, that salesperson out there pushes the right buttons, greed buttons or fear buttons, look out. Doesn't matter how many, how many decades of experience that I have or the fact that I've got the longest running financial program in the country. Oh, been right again and again and again and again. People to this day, to this day, will call me up and ask me questions about certain things that they've heard about or an investment that they've heard about. I've warned them that it's a scam and they don't listen. Here's one. Here's one of them. You're all all familiar with the company, the income store. Well, this company advertised a lot on satellite radio. Advertised a lot on satellite radio. This company, what it did was it offered offered investors a hands-off. All you do is you give them money. Monthly income. You would get monthly income. No skills. No skills are required at all. You just gave them money. Well, they, they ripped people off to the tune of about $75 million. Uh, the SEC just freezed, uh, just froze their assets. Um, basically, what the company did was it built websites selling stuff. Not making this up. They built websites that sold stuff, a variety of products. Now, what they told investors was that they would pay them half of what their websites generated each month and would guarantee, they said, we'll also guarantee you a minimum monthly return if revenues fell too low. Now, again, guarantee. Guarantee. You know, I, I probably should have uh, pulled up the, the bit from Tommy Boy here on the program. Chris Farley is trying to get the contract for the brake pads and the, uh, was it, uh, he, like the guy told him, he said, well, Zelensky puts a guarantee on the box. People love a guarantee. Man, a guarantee makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside, doesn't it? And, and basically what 
what Chris Farley did in, in winning the contract is he explained to the owner of the auto parts store that um, you could take a, you know what, in a box and you could put a guarantee on it. And what you get is a guaranteed box of what? And that's basically what this was. The guy was guaranteeing a minimum monthly return. You don't ask the question how that's possible. Huh? Uh, we're out of time. Where are we? Yeah. Well, well, we're going to continue on. We're going to do, do a little bit more. Do a little bit more on the ripoffs and scams here. I'm just getting warm. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Newsletter consultations with our certified financial planners. We'll be back. You're listening to The Watchdog on Wall Street. The only man who is taking on the Wall Street establishment. You're listening to The Watchdog on Wall Street with Chris Markowski. Welcome back. It is the watchdog on Wall Street. I'm, I'm going to continue on with this. We're doing ripoffs and scams. We're going to have a little bit of fun here. Um, again, this company, you give them money, we will guarantee you a minimum return. A minimum monthly return if the revenue is from your website that you didn't build. You don't even know what they're selling. They're doing it for you. We're going to build your website. We're going to sell the stuff, and you're going to make half the money on it. Yep. The company also guaranteed, again, I want to remind everybody about these guarantees on investments. Okay? Think of a box with somebody taking a dump in it. Chris Farley, Tommy Boy. That's what it is. That's what your guarantee is. Guaranteed returns of anywhere between 13 and 20%. 13 and 20%. Per month. Uh, uh, again, shame on, uh, and I, I'm going to say something here, and I know it's going to tick off probably some of the affiliates. I, I've actually lost radio stations over the years for just being honest here on the program. I, I have. You, 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 you are airing advertisements. Somebody guaranteeing. Guaranteeing people. 13 to 20 percent a month on their investment you know the funny thing is the hypocritical thing is here you can't say swear words on the air but you can lie to people all you want make stuff up that doesn't matter you mean to tell me that honestly that the radio station owners does it they don't know that it's a lie how do you look yourself in a mirror and and take that advertisement I just out of curiosity how do you do it how do you take how do you take how do you allow somebody on your radio station that you know is hosting a program that's ripping people off? You don't do any homework at all? At all? <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, it's stories here uh, that it was a big fugazi. The whole entire company generated about $9 million in sales. The company paid out $30 million, and how did they do that? Ponzi scheme. They had to take more money in again if you took a look at what 13 to 20 percent a month you play with a compounding calculator in, in in you know a few short years you'd be one of the wealthiest people in the world i mean it's it's patently absurd anyway another one here um again more and more of these connecticut hedge fund manager pleading guilty uh, to misleading his investors, built them out of $20 million over a three-year period. Um, yeah, I, I get the phone calls on a regular basis. I do. Hey, Chris, have you heard about this hedge fund? Oh, I got invited. I said, uh, you know, I met this guy at the country club. This guy's you know, this hedge fund guy. You see the car this guy's driving. Wow. You should have seen the car that this guy's driving. His, his Rolex must have been worth about $20,000. You have any idea? This guy was loaded. He's got to be doing a good job. No. Wrong. Wrong. Hey, you don't know that. Let me, let me see the information about his fund. Let me tell me exactly what he's doing. I'll tell you whether or not he's legit. Doesn't take me long to tell you. I'll tell you who's legit and who's not legit. I warned people about Madoff. 
and my issue when I talked about last segment. More often than not, I fail. I'll break it down. I'll explain to investors. Just like the income store. It's a scam. It's a scam. Think about it. Use your head. But if somebody has already convinced themselves, you know what happens in, in people's minds? Is they start cashing checks that they don't have. They, they start, it, it, it turns into fantasy, a fantasy island for them where, wow, wow, I, I, I'm going to, if I put this amount of money in, I'm going to be doing this much and then I'll be able to get that boat or then I'll be able to go on vacation. And in their mind, they have the money already. These, these investment con artists, they use that. They'll give you the numbers. They'll say, well, you know what? If you put this amount of money in and, you know, we're going to get generate these types of returns, this is what you can expect to get. Would you like that, Mr. Jones? Do you think that that would be a good idea? Would you be happy making that type of money? And they get you saying yes. They get you agreeing to things. Then they'll find out what you want. Then they'll press their greed buttons and, boop, you're sold. You're sold, and I lose. I lose. They, you, you, I don't even know what people come, they, they actually get angry with me. People will come to me with some investment that they have been proposed, uh, whatever it may be, some hedge fund, whatever, oil and gas partnership, you name it. And I'll tell them it's a scam. I'll tell them it's a scam, and they get ticked off at me. <laughs> it's my fault that it's a scam. No, they, they want me to give them the, the all clear. Sorry. This one, um, again, yeah, this is out of my, uh, where I used to live, down in Sarasota, Brainton, for about 15 years. Um, yeah, this uh, big investment firm, Longboat Key. Longboat Key, uh, Sarasota, these guys, um, yeah, they'd be going to all of the, it's one thing they have a lot of in Sarasota and Brainton. They have a lot of benefits. And a lot of galas that you can go as one every night. Then you can do the circuit. And, oh, yeah, how much money is going to that charity? Uh, they never give you that answer. That's why I never participate in any of that crap. Yeah, another $72 million Ponzi scheme. Oh, yeah, we're the Cayman Island Fund, and we invest in currencies, and we're going to guarantee you this. Yeah, I guarantee you're going to lose. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Watchdog on WallStreet.com. Don't go anywhere. Your Wall Street watchdog. I Chris Markowski is the watchdog on Wall Street. 